Hallelujah. Honor the woman of God for coming all this way to be with us today. She didn't have to be here. Her and her husband didn't have to rearrange their life and their schedule. I think they're getting ready to go on an international trip for ministry, and they graced us today so kindly and humbly with their presence, and I praise the Lord for it. Well, you can return to your seat. We want to get to the word of the Lord today. I know we'll have a number of baptismal celebrations to be a part of here in just a bit. Thank you, every single visitor and regular attender as well. How about we welcome the online community? I always want them to know we never forget them. We love them. We admire their tenacity. How many of you are going to be here tonight at 6 o'clock for our mass deliverance service? Put your hand high in the air. It's going to be a remarkable crowd. Uh, I knew a lot of folks would be here for Memorial Day weekend to celebrate with us and get freedom. Tonight is... Sunday night consecutively week number 70. 70 straight Sunday nights of a mass deliverance service in which hundreds of people still show up from all over the country and all around the world, and many of them just for the one service. We'll see people that will bus in, that will fly in, drive in, Uber in, hike in, bicycle and mule in, whatever. They'll be here just for tonight's service. They're not even here today, but we are honored that each and every one of you are here. Well, it would be difficult to have Pentecost Sunday and have such a prophetic moment upon us and not deal with the subject from Acts chapter 2. So I want you to go there in the good word of the Lord this morning, Acts chapter number 2. Because of the lengthiness of a number of verses that I want to preach on in context. I won't have you stand and read through all of the text as we do so often here because I'm just going to pray and dive right in and we're just going to systematically go verse by verse, line by line, phrase by phrase as we always do because it's the meat of the Word of God that's going to feed you, that's going to change your life, that's going to radically, dramatically be the actual deliverance that you need. And so I, I love the fact that we have a church that is hungry for the Bible. They love the Word of God in this church. You make it easy to teach. You make it easy to preach. And I thank the Lord for that. And by the way, when I came back, our, our bus was giving us a little bit of a weirdness as I came from uh, South Carolina. And then yesterday and Friday night, I was with Pastor Vlad in Chicago. And we were there at the hub. And then the bus was kind of acting a little weird. And so we got in this morning at like 4 o'clock, right? The team got back in like 4 o'clock. And I uh, got a couple hours of sleep, grabbed some Dunkin' Donuts, praise God, and here we are. But... When I walked in this morning, it was the first time I got to see the, the new projecting out of the pulpit. I like it. Give our guys a hand, man. They worked hard. I mean, I go away for a couple of days and come back, and they got the whole thing. I had it in my mind. I was in a conference, and uh, I saw it, and I was like, you know what? I like that. Not only do I like to be able to, to see the screens, right, but I want the preaching and the Word to always be the forefront of what we do here at the church. I mean, it's the Word of God that's the most important because the worship sets the table for the feast of the meat and potatoes of God's Word. Amen? Well, let's pray, and we're going to jump right into Acts chapter 2. It's a very familiar passage, but I trust that I can share it in a way as the Holy Spirit has downloaded some things into my heart and my life as your pastor that when you walk away, you will know that this is not just a normal day. This was the day that put the church on the map as we know it. And I recognize the fact that it in itself was a one-time event. But the principles and the presence and the power of Pentecost still move through us this very day. And we would not be in this gospel preaching tent as a local New Testament church that is the pillar and ground of the truth if it were not for this day some 2,000 years ago on the day of Pentecost. So let's pray and we're going to jump in. Father in heaven, I ask that you would help me as I preach and teach the power of the word of God. I confess to you and to these my friends that if anything today is going to be eternal and life changing, you're going to have to do it, Lord, because I can't. Fill me with power. Fill me with wisdom. Fill us with patience as we navigate the text. Because, Lord, we don't want to miss stuff. This is not called the stories of God the ideas of God, the thoughts of God. is called the Word of God. So we have to pay attention to the words that you gave us to read. So Lord, set people free in this house. Lord, I pray if there is one here that has come to church but they've never come to Christ, Holy Spirit, convict them and show them their need to repent and believe the gospel. 
May those that have been saved but they've never followed you in believers' baptism, may today they be convicted to obey and go through the waters of baptism. Those that need healing, deliverance, whatever it is, today we give you room to move in this house. So teach us exactly what you want us to learn because you brought us here for a specific purpose today and we thank you for it in the mighty name of Jesus and all of God's people said Amen. you're no stranger to Acts chapter number 2 but I must be honest in my days of cessationism in my days of denying the reality of the gifts to me the word Pentecost was a word that you wanted to skirt around and it may have been mentioned out of the middle of a song in a red back hymnal but to us Pentecost and Pentecostalism was nothing more than a crazy charismaniac denomination and so we stayed away from it and I would talk about the church being the pillar and the ground of the truth and how Jesus said I will build my church notice it's not our church it's his church he said I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it not that the gates wouldn't come against it not that the weapon would not be formed but it would not prosper and the local church will survive any cataclysmic problem that the world the culture and the government sends its way because the church is God's organism not man's organization so I would read Acts chapter 2 and I would be like, well, you know, let's just kind of skip down to the end where they were taking up big offerings and people were being saved, baptizing converts. And, and let's skip some of that stuff because it's uncomfortable. Then I started reading and I'm like, oh yeah, I like the uncomfortable factor. Because it was in reading the Bible making me uncomfortable that God began to convict me in such ways that our church began to shift and our church began to change. And we were challenged to read the Bible for what it says, not for what we were taught that it says. So today we remove the lenses denominationally of any denomination. Uh, of any man-made forcibleness into the text. And we remove those lenses. And we read the historical account of what happened on the day of Pentecost the way that it's meant to be read. So I want you to notice what happens in verse number one. It says, and when the day of Pentecost, shout Pentecost. It means 50, 50 days after the resurrection, 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead. And by the way, had he stayed in the tomb, you would be in hell with a broke back this morning. He died for my salvation, but the Bible says in Romans 4 and 5, he rose again for our justification. He put us in a position just as if we had never sinned against God. Because he that knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And Jesus rose from the dead. And 50 days later, the promise of John 14 through 16 was fulfilled. When I go up, he will come down. And he said, because I go to my father. This is a whole other message, but follow me. He said, and because I go to my father. And the spirit of truth will come unto you. Greater works shall you do than I have done. Now, I don't know where in our mindset denominationally we decided to skip over things like that because it made us feel weird. He's not saying that we are greater than Jesus. He is saying that we are operating from a different presence and the Bible says when Jesus goes up, the power of the Holy Spirit comes down and things start happening and business picks up at the house. So when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord. She mentioned that a moment ago. Unity was in the midst of them. They weren't sitting around fussing and having factions and splitting this and splitting that and theologically dancing around stuff and mad at each other. I am so glad when the church started, there was no Facebook. I don't know that it would have survived 2,000 years of social media. We've barely survived 15 years of social media. And so they were all in one accord in one place. And I remind you, there's 120 some odd people in a room waiting for the promise of the Father. They weren't up there having a session where they were talking about all the good and all the bad. And they didn't like this person and they don't like that. No, for 
days they stayed in an upper room chamber and they waited because Jesus said, look, you're going to turn the world upside down. You're going to cast out devils. You're going to preach the gospel. Things are going to happen. But don't do it until you wait for the endowment from on high. And he said, because you shall receive power. That's affirmative. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. The dunamis of God, the dynamite of God's power, you'll receive it. And when you do, you'll be witnesses. So my question is, why is it that there's such a lack of witnessing in the American church? Because there's a lack of power of the Holy Spirit in the American church. Because the first result of the power of the Holy Ghost was that we'd be witnesses of the gospel of Jesus. And so they were all in one place. Verse 2, and suddenly, that's the theme of the book of Acts. You can have all the plans you want to, but God will show up and wreck the whole place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Notice the sound was not from the stage. The sound was not from the microphone. The sound was not from the land. The sound was from heaven. As of a rushing, I love this, mighty wind. And it filled, not just a little bit, a lot of bit. It filled all the house where they were sitting. So you don't even have the breakout into the community yet in the context. You have only the break in of the Holy Spirit and the breakout in the context of the room as these people were filled to overflowing with the presence of God in a way that they've never tangibly expected it or experienced it before. This was new. This was new. And it's amazing that some 2,000 years later we can be so churched and to some of us it's still new. We've been taught wrong. Look, I wasn't a false prophet. I wasn't a fake shepherd. I wasn't getting up and just purposely deceiving people. I preached what I knew. I saw things through the context of what I'd been taught. And I was taught, don't ever question the pastoral authority because they know best. What is this, like ex cathedra popism? Never question the integrity and the authority of the man of God. I'm the one that will teach you the Bible. No, the Holy Ghost will teach you the Bible because he's the best Bible teacher you'll ever have. He's the greatest PhD on the planet. So the Bible will mess up a lot of what we think is good preaching. And so all of a sudden I began to see things differently because this house was filled where they were sitting and there appeared, verse 3, unto them, these people, cloven tongues like as a fire. Now watch this. And it set upon each of them. Now when he talks about cloven tongues, he's about to talk about verbal tongues, but this was a physical manifestation of a flickering flame that was above their head. They were lit by Jesus in that moment. And the flame was something that was visible, and now it's going to turn into something that is verbal. Watch this, verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And as one of the evident results of that, they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I used to read it like this. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, verse 5. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men. <laughs> Skip that weird part. And by the way, let me say this. One thing you need to stop doing is praying that God gives you another tongue if you can't already control the one that's sitting in your mouth. Right? Oh, I need a new tongue. No, you need to control the one you got. And so the Bible says that they were filled and they began to speak with other tongues. But here's the declarative statement. As the Spirit, this wasn't nonsense. This wasn't made up. This was a verbal manifestation that came from the Spirit. As the Spirit gave them the utterance. Romans chapter 8 says the Spirit of God comes and prays with utterance and groanings which cannot even be heard and understood. And He prays through us. And that's why Ephesians 5 says praying always in the Spirit. It's amazing how much of that I missed for so many years or at least ignored and just pretend to miss it. Verse 5 says, And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, so these are religious individuals out of every nation under heaven. So it was a whole amalgamation, a whole plethora of people were there to see what was happening. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. Here's what shocked them. Here's what confused them. Because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Now, please understand something. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, when he talks about the gifts of manifestation and then the rules by which they operate in the local church in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it tells us that there are varying degrees of tongues. 
You see, all we ever think of is, oh, that person spoke in tongues. That person prayed in tongues. No, there are varying diversities of the different types of tongues in the Bible. For some people, the evident gift of a miraculous tongue that is given by the utterance of the Holy Spirit is like I told some of you a few weeks ago. In one year from now, I'm praying I can get up and preach a whole message in Spanish to GV Espanol, right? Sometimes God will just give you an ability to do that. There are varying degrees of tongues, but here's what you've got to understand. And here's what we've never been taught. And I think this is important that you encircle this and get it in your mind. Why was this such a not controversial, but convicting and important aspect of the day of Pentecost? Why every man hearing that in their own language? Why even initiate something that's going to be the most extraordinarily controversial subject in modern times in Christianity. And it is. I'm going to tell you why. You know the first time tongues was mentioned in the Bible, it was not a blessing, it was a curse from God. It was the Tower of Babel. God said, these people be of one heart and of one mind, and because of that, they can do anything. Which, by the way, you get a church that's of one heart and one mind, God will do anything through them. That's a whole message. And God said, let us go down and confound their tongues, confuse their languages. So I find it interesting that when man was at a place of worshiping self and trying to become God, God cursed them with tongues. But when the Holy Spirit was going to come to remove the curse and fulfill the promise of the Father, the thing that was a curse in the Old Testament became the very prophetic blessing of the New Testament. And the thing that God used to confound them is now the thing that God uses to unite them. Does that make sense? So you better be careful when you start saying, oh, that's just a bunch of hogwash. That's a bunch of jibber-jabber. That's a bunch of nonsense. No, God turned a curse into a blessing. On the day of Pentecost. That's why there's this transition. Because when you first are introduced to the subject of languages, it's not good. When we are reintroduced to the subject of languages, including an angelic, spirit-filled language, it is a blessing to the people of God that is still talked about and fought over to this very day. And so they heard every man in his own language. Watch this, verse 7. And they were all amazed... That blesses me when I read that because the modern day church would read it like this. And they were all amused. I'm so tired of amusing church services. What can you do for my kids? You know, six flags over Jesus. Disneyland on ice. What kind of music do you have? Do you have 7,000 small groups? Sometimes I preach for these pastors and they're like, well, I just want you to know, Pastor Locke, that God's doing such good things around here. We have 500 individual ministries. And I'm like, I feel sorry for you, bro. That's a lot of ministry, right? That's a lot of ministry. And people think that busyness and activity equals revival and spirituality. And I know active churches that are dry as cracker juice. And yet the Bible says when the power of God showed up, the people looked around in amazement. They weren't looking for the next big thing. They weren't looking for a, a show they weren't looking for a clown show. They were looking, what is going on? This is amazing. And listen, I want to leave the legacy of pastoring a church that is amazing for God, not amusing to the culture. I don't care if the culture likes or dislikes us. We want to reach people with the gospel, but I'm called to feed the sheep, not slop the hogs and entertain the goats. And so he says... They were amazed and they marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? Like these people are of the same group. How in the world is every man, verse 8, how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phygeria, Pamphylia and Egypt, the parts of Libya about Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews, proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, 18 nationalities by the way. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. That was the definitive phrase that you have to understand. They were not there to glorify each other. They were there to glorify God for what he was doing in their midst. He was doing a new thing that they had never seen before. And every one of these 18 different groupings and tribes and people heard the word of God in their own tongue. 
Now watch, verse 12, again, and they were all amazed. And it was the same thing in both accounts that amazed them so deeply. And they were amazed. They were stricken that moment. And watch this, this always creeps in, were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? You remember in Mark chapter 2, some people tore a house up to let a man down who was a quadriplegic at the feet of Jesus. They didn't even ask permission. They just like went to the man's shed, got a shovel and a pickaxe and just started tearing his old house up. Lowered the man down. Jesus said, your sins be forgiven you. Get up and walk. Guy rolled up his cot, woo, skipped to blue, my darling, and ran home. And the Bible says, and all of them were amazed. Again, not amused. They were amazed. They glorified God. And then others said, wow, we've never seen it on this wise before. And to be honest with you, the context of people's understanding of God's working has not changed a whole lot in the church world because here's what people say, can we do that? We've never done it like that, preacher. Them folks done marched around the building. Right? I like it. March on, praise God. And so these people are like, what meaneth this? What are we involved in? And there was some doubt as to what God was trying to do. But watch what happens next. Others mocking said, well, these men are full of new wine. People standing around like, what is going on? This is amazing. This is unbelievable. Did you see that? Did you sense that? Did you hear that? Did you feel that? And then some of them religious people were like, ah, yeah, and people drunker and cooter brown over. Been messing around with some Budweiser all night. Bunch of drunkards. That's of the devil. Let me call a time out and say this. You better be careful when the Holy Ghost is working what you call of the devil. You better be careful. You'll stand before God, not me for that, right? So they say, oh, these, these people are drunk. These people don't know what they're doing. They're crazy. They're full of new wine. There's always going to be people that do not understand the power of God in your life. Now, look, let me teach you something about the presence of God you need to understand. The eternal presence of God is everywhere, all the time, every day, every second. I get it. But there's only sometimes in your life the manifest presence of God shows up. And when the manifest presence of God shows up in your life, there'll always be people that question it. Well, you can't preach like that. You can't sing like that. You can't cast out demons. You can't perform miracles. There's no signs. There's no wonders. You know what the Bible says, that an evil and adulterous generation seeks after signs. I'm not seeking after signs. You get right with God, and the signs will seek after you, because in my name shall these signs follow them. They shall cast out demons. They'll speak in other tongues, tread on scorpions and serpents. If they have to drink any deadly poison, which, by the way, is not an invitation to do it, it's a protection for when it's done to you because the gospel was so powerful then that people wanted to stop them from preaching the gospel. And they said, well, we'll just poison them. And they're like, go right ahead, Skippy. I'm going to live right through it. I got a stomach of iron by the power of the Holy Ghost. Lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So we're not seeking signs. Signs follow believers. And so there'll always be people that discount it. There'll always be the armchair theologians in their mother's basement that say, you can't do this, blah, 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 blah. People are like, oh, Brother Locke, I need to take about two hours of your time because I have some questions and concerns. If you have questions, I'll answer them. If you have concerns, that's cool. If you want to simply justify your denominational way of thinking and be mad about everything that we're doing in our church, I don't have time for it. I've already turned that curve. I ain't going back, right? So, so don't ask me, well, why do y'all cast out demons? Because the Bible tells us to. How can you still believe in healing and the gifts? Because the Bible says I can well, I just don't know about them women getting up on the platform. Don't even argue with me on that because that chapter is closed and you have taken that so out of Baptistic context that I don't have time to argue with you about that. So if those are the questions that you have, let's just go ahead and close your notebook because we ain't meeting. Okay? Yeah, here's, what, here's what Nehemiah said. When Sanballat and Tobiah came against him, the Bible says that Nehemiah was on a wall building and battling. Right? He's building with one hand, he's battling with the other. Building with one hand, battling with the other. And old Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian, they came up and they said, hey, Nehemiah, we need to have a council meeting. Deacons got together. They don't like the transition you've made. 
and we need you to come down and meet us in the plains of a place called Ono. O-N-O. You know what Nehemiah said? Oh, no. <laughs> you better say no to oh, no. He said, I ain't coming down off this wall. I'm building. I'm battling. I ain't arguing with you. I ain't defending myself. I ain't fussing. I'm not answering your questions. I'm not breaking a sweat. And I'm not backing up, packing up, or slacking up. Just going to keep going. So he said, I ain't got time to come off the wall. So he said, oh, no to oh, no. And you're always going to have them critics that think you're crazy. So I like people like Peter. He was pretty raw. I mean, he was like, you know, the first young adult in Jesus' youth group to stab somebody. <laughs> Thank you got youth group troubles. But Peter standing up with the 11. I like that, that unity there. Peter standing up with the 11 lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words, for these are not drunken as ye suppose. These people aren't drunken because you think they are seeing it is but the third hour of the day. He's like, look, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. They're not drunk yet. You know, don't, don't throw that upon them. That's a poor criticism. It's nine o'clock. It's only just this particular hour of the day. It's still early. He says, it's not a drunkenness, but let me tell you what it is, verse 16. But this is that. One of the guys the other day bought me a hat that says, this is that. So I guess I'll call it the this is that hat. Because I'm telling you, in our pulpits all over America, we got a lot of fluff, puff, and fat. But we don't nearly have enough. This is that preaching. He said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Thus saith the Lord. And he began to quote the Bible. And Bible preaching ought to really come out of the Bible. And so he said, look, these folks aren't drunk. And let me tell you what this is. It's a fulfillment. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he begins to quote Joel chapter 2. And he says in that context, and it shall come to pass in the last days. Now stop. Encircle that, understand something. What Peter was saying was two, three, four, maybe tenfold. There's a lot here that we don't have time to, to unpackage all of it. But he says, today, as he's preaching on the day of Pentecost, today begins the starting prophetic fulfillment of what happened when Joel said, in the last days, God will pour out his spirit. So the question is, when did the last days begin? Right there in that verse. And everybody's like, well, you know, where are the signs of his coming? We've been in the last days for a long time. We've been waiting 2,000 years. Read an Old Testament. It took Jesus 4,000 years to show up the first time. We're not behind. A day with the Lord's 1,000 years, 1,000 years as a day. So he said, let me tell you what this is. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, not saith Joel. Not saith man, saith God. He was speaking as God was ushering through him. I will pour out of my, capital S, spirit upon all flesh. This was the starting point for that. That's why he's quoting it. They didn't understand the experience of the manifest presence of the Holy Spirit the way we do now. This was the first moment it happened in history. This was the inaugural baptism of the church as we know it. And so he said, this is that. As God's going to pour out of his spirit upon all flesh. All of them. The people you like and the people you don't. Baptist flesh, Pentecostal flesh, Church of God flesh, white flesh, black flesh. He said, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Now notice, because I'm, I'm going somewhere to connect this context and it's so important that you see this. Here was one of the evident results of God speaking then and still speaking now. Does that make sense? Watch what he says happens when the Spirit of God shows up. And your sons, that would be male, target. <laughs> and your daughters, that would be female. You see, I, I used to say, and your sons shall prophesy. Oh, no, no, it doesn't say that. 
It says, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Well, I, 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 uh, 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 I don't want none of that baptistic porky pig syndrome. Boo, 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 done with it. Either the Bible says it right here, black words on white paper, or it doesn't. And God's a liar. And we know God's not a liar because Titus 1, 2 says God can't lie. So he said in the last days of which we're living in, as we'll see in the narrative in a moment, he's going to prove that, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. They're going to get a word from the Lord. And it, by the way, it's not going to contradict the word of the Lord, but they're going to have a word from the Lord that encourages people, that lifts people, that warns people. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, watch this, and your young men shall see visions. And then your old men shall dream dreams. So I guess at 47, I see a few visions and dream a few dreams because I'm kind of right there in the middle and don't know really where I stick, right? <laughs> but he clearly said that one of the ways that God was going to speak in the last days was through prophecy, was through visions, and through dreams. And I'm here to tell you, much of the church in the American landscape denies all three of them. Well, you know, that's extra biblical revelation. Only if it tells you to do something that's extra biblical. Only if, it, if you're saying, this is from the Lord, but you know good and well, it's not from the Lord. I've had people say, well, you know, I just feel like the Lord wants me to leave my spouse just because I'm not happy. And there's this person at work that just makes me so much more happy. And I got a word from the Lord. You got a life train wreck from the devil is what you got when you start blaming God on things that you know are counterintuitive and contradictory to what the Bible says. God's not going to tell you to do things that are totally against the Bible. You ever met somebody, they spend their whole life saying, well, I know what the Bible says, but, but, but. Hey, when it comes to the Bible, keep your butt out of it. Let the Bible say what the Bible says. Amen? So he says, young men, see visions. Old men, dream dreams. And, I love this, on my servants and on my handmaidens. I will pour out in those days which are still upon us since the inauguration 2,000 years ago. I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they, who's they in the context, servants and handmaidens shall prophesy. Notice, he does not say, and I will pour out my spirit so that prophecy can come through all the famous preachers that have big TikTok pages and blue check marks on Facebook. No, no, no. He said on my servants and on my handmaidens. On regular folk in the church. Normal folk. Regular men, regular women that have gifts for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You have a gift. If you bury it, God will dig it up and give it to somebody that will steward it better than you. And you'll have to watch them do what the Holy Spirit called you to do, and that's miserable. God wants to use everybody in this room, the handmaidens, the servants. You see, the power of God is not for the pastors only. It's for the plumbers, the stay-at-home moms. For the electricians, for the over-the-road truckers, for the farmers. It's for all of us. The young, the old alike. It's for all of us, no matter what your background is. My job as a pastor is to put your past where it belongs, behind you. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth under those things which are before. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God. And God has a gift for you. Yes, you. He wants to use you just like you are. I read about a... A crippled boy that came to a service one day and there was an old preacher, Dr. B.R. Lakin from West Virginia. He was preaching. He was saying, God can use anybody. God can use anybody. Whole message. I mean, he just went after it. Well, this guy was going to test that theory. Crippled up. Had a little rag on the side of his shoulder where he couldn't control spit coming out of his mouth. His head would shake. Hands were all twisted and contorted. He crawled out in the aisle. Got him little crutches and began to make his little crippled legs get down to that platform. Oh, he heard the message. God can use anybody. God can use anybody. Well, he got up on the first, second, third, fourth, fifth step, crawled up there and sat down right by the preacher when he was getting finished. He said, Dr. Lakin, I understand from what you said that God can use anybody. He said, that's right, son. God can use anybody. He said, I have a hard time believing that. Would you look at me? 
My body's twisted and contorted. I can't control some of my bodily functions. People laugh at me. I got to have help getting ready and getting changed and getting fed. He said, I just don't know if I believe that God can use anybody. Would you look at me? I'm nothing but a mess. And Dr. Lakin chuckled and said, sir, God's been looking for a mess like you for a long time, son. And God's been looking for a mess like you and like you and like you and like me. He's just been looking for a mess to make him a message for the gospel. And he said, on my handmaidens, on my servants, just on regular people, I'm going to fall and manifest my glory. Now watch this. Here's where things get a little dicey in the context. You've got to pay attention. He's talking about the fulfillment of what happened that day. It was the, it was the slingshot moment that both started and placed the church in historical trajectory. All right? He's like, this is happening now. But then he starts talking about something that has still yet not happened. We, we've still not seen what happens next. Here's what we call this theologically. I'm not trying to impress you. I'm trying to help you. We call this in, in Bible theology the law of double reference. It's one passage that speaks about two things at the same time. That's why you have to pay attention to the Bible in context. And so he's talking about the day of Pentecost starting and continuing to this day. And here's the proof of that. Verse 19. And I will show wonders in heaven above. And signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. So that, that sounds a little bit like Daniel, Ezekiel, Revelation, prophetic things that have not yet taken place, but they will because God said so. And so he, he begins to talk about something that is yet in the future. However long from now, we don't know. But he says... The Spirit of God's going to pour out Himself upon all flesh in the last days. It began on the day of Pentecost. And then all of a sudden He shifts gears and says, Let me talk about prophetically what's going to happen in the last of the last days. When things start gearing down and God starts changing stuff. Watch this, verse 20. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before, before when? That great and notable day of the Lord come. Now look, just help me out. Is that yet in the future, yes or no? Yes. Some of y'all are scared to answer that. Is that yet in the future, yes or no? Yes. He begins by talking about something that was happening the moment he said it. But then he transitions into something that's not happened at all over the last 2,000 years. And we don't even know predictively into the future practically when it's going to happen. We just know it's going to because God said so. Someone says, well, you can't prove that Jesus is coming this week. Well, you can't prove he's not, so you better live like he's going to. And so he said, I, I'm going to show you these things are going to happen. So the question then becomes, why would he take an event that was happening before him and then mention a prophetic event that we have still to this day, some 2,000 years later, not even seen the fulfillment of yet. In the same breath. Because of what happens next. Verse 21. And it shall come to pass. <laughs> that whosoever. He's still talking about Joel, by the way. That whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And it's an interchangeable word, by the way, because in Joel 2.15, he said in the last days, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Okay, it's individual, uh, interchangeable terminology here. But here's why that is important. Why do we say, well, you know, Pentecost was a one and done, and those principles no longer apply, and there's no miracles, signs, wonders, healings, deliverance, manifested gifts, no tongues, none of that. No every man hearing in their own language, certainly no angelic spirit-filled language. That stuff just does not work anymore. It's done. It's gone. Why is it that we say that about something that clearly happened that day, but then we skip over the fact that that stuff does not cease until the great and notable, terrible day of the Lord? Because the next verse would tell us that in the last days of which we are in, that one of the proofs that's in the spiritual pudding, as it were, that God is still working now the way he was working then, is that in the last days, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
Why do we love to claim whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, but we refuse to identify the fact that he said it in the context of that's going to happen until Jesus comes again. In the same context of in the last days, God's going to pour out his spirit upon flesh. Sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men see visions. Old men dream dreams. And on my servants and headmaidens, I'll pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. And we're like, yep, he did that on the day of Pentecost. According to the next three and a half verses, he continues to do it until the great and notable terrible day of the Lord because all the way up until that moment, that millisecond, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Does that help you? That's what the Bible teaches. That's why there is the law of double reference. It's almost like the Holy Spirit. And I'm careful and reverent in how I say this. It's almost like the Holy Spirit 2,000 years ago said, let me just go ahead and preemptively fix cessationism right at, out of the gate. Let, let me just go ahead and fix all this. There's no gifts. There's no miracles. There's no signs. Pentecost was one and done, and we don't see it anymore. He said, let me just go ahead and fix that, and I'll fix it by continuing Pentecost all the way into the second coming of Jesus. <laughs> and he said, because of that fact, that even until this moment, whoever calls on the name of Jesus will be saved, will be delivered. So why is it that we emphatically and fervently believe that? But we skip the parts where Pentecost is going to live on in presence and principle until the sun goes dark and the moon turns to blood. You see, Pentecost was not a moment of conclusion. It was a moment of introduction. And I know that makes us nervous. And we're like, well, you know, that's just, that's just not the way I learn things. The greatest thing I ever did in my walk with Jesus was unlearn some stuff. I'm not against teaching. I'm not against seminaries. I'm not against courses and colleges and, you know, tracks and things that we need to take and reading books. I'm, 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 I'm a reader, right? I love to read. I read all the time. But I'm going to be honest with you. Why is it that we want to read things out of the Bible that are clearly there that need to be read into the Word of God? Why do we not just take it for face value? I'll tell you why. Because James says the Word of God is a mirror. So here's what you do with a mirror. You look into it, and as long as it's not one of them, you know, carnival mirrors, fat mini mirror, skinny mirror, you know, whatever. Okay, I'm talking about an actual mirror, not one of these weird things that make you look like an hourglass, right? You look into an actual mirror. And with no chills, no frills, no thrills, it shows you what you're looking at. It doesn't care what the reflection is. Because its job is not to get its feelings hurt over your reflection. Its job is to show you what needs to be reflected so you can fix it. So when you see something in the mirror, you know, you, you, you got a nick on your face from shaving or you got, you know, something hanging out of your eye or whatever, right? Something hanging out of your nose. You got salad between your teeth, okay? When you look in the mirror, you have a choice. And really, there's only one choice that you have, right? You can change what you see based on the reflection. You can change what you see in the mirror. Or you can get uber religious and just change the mirror. Hmm? You don't like what the mirror shows, so don't fix what it shows, just change the mirror. Just get one that makes you look cleaner and better and whatever. And so what we've learned to do is we've learned in this fancy Instagram society to filter the context of the Word of God so that it fits what we want it to say, not what the Holy Spirit intended for it to say. I mean, think about, the, think about the generation that we are in. And I'm, obviously, I'm not against social media. We're all over it, right? And, and you've got to harness it because it'll blow your face off. Don't chase all them storms, okay? You ain't got to make a video about everything. I used to think I did. Oh, i got to do this, this, and God said, sit down, shut up. You ain't got to do a video on your truck every five minutes. And so what we've learned in this social media-driven world, especially Instagram, you ever notice we don't call them youfies, we call them selfies? And I take a lot of them with people, and so I'm not castigizing that. But, but you have to understand something. 
We have taught people to build a superstructure with no foundation. So this generation sees somebody with a couple of hundred thousand followers on Instagram and a blue check mark, which you can buy these days. So it's like the curl on a pig's tail, right? It's cute, but it don't make no more ham. And so they look at this and they're like, oh, wow, let me, let me, let me filter through their pictures. And what they see are these perfect marriages, perfect children. We had a laugh right there. Right? Everything's in array. Everything's perfect. Everything's beautiful. And so what we've taught people is, as long as it's what people see, build it. But it's what people don't see that you should be working on building. Because the wise man built his house upon a rock and the foolish man built his house upon the sand. But here's what the song don't tell you, but the word does. They got the same rain, they got the same wind, and they got the same flood, but they had totally different results. Because we've taught people build up so that people see it, but not build down what people don't see. So here's what happens. We look at marriages, for example. You can scroll through pictures and you're like, wow, how come me and my wife and our kids can't sit like that for a picture? <laughs> what a family. Look at the glory of God upon them. Those children are so still. That husband is so patient. That lady's just so pretty. Wow. The picture perfect family. It's a picture. And some people are better at pictures than others. I get it. But know this. They had to threaten those kids within inches of their life for 45 minutes. And give them Cheetos and goldfish and fruit roll-ups. And, and, you know, I'm going to pull my belt off. So, I mean, I did, they had to do everything on the planet to get them kids to sit down. Then mama had to take a deep breath and not be mad. Daddy had to quit flexing because he was tore up. And they're like, smile. Oh, we got it. And then they put it through a filter. And the generation of young people look at that and they're like, wow, what a picture perfect life. Look at that car they drive. Wow, look at, look, look at the gal that that guy's got. Whoo! Won't she make a great help meet? She's so beautiful. Well, careful that she's not a hellcat. You don't want one of them. You see, we've taught people just take a picture and build what everybody sees and ignore what people don't see and their whole life falls apart. Their whole life falls apart. And we've raised a generation of church people that think it's about buildings and bigness and screens and lights and performance and talent. You know, I know lost people that hate God, spit on the Bible, never go to church and smoke crack that have talent. You see, talent will take you so far to make you money, but character and integrity and honesty and the fear of the Lord will make you the man and woman of God that the Holy Ghost has called you to be. And Peter stands up and says, These are not drunken as ye suppose, but this is that, this is that, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And what was spoken by him then was being fulfilled at that moment and is still being fulfilled to this day. Do not be afraid of what the Holy Spirit has for his body. It's been rightly said. I think Leonard Ravenhill said it. The Holy Spirit deeply desires to have his church back. We've productionized it. We've produced it. We've overproduced it. People are tired of it. Same old thing. Come in, come out. Stand, sit, give, be greedy. Don't say amen too loud. Somebody will rubberneck around and wonder what's going on. Don't raise your hand. You'll get called on as if you have a question. And we have made church so formal, so rigid, so structured 
that when God shows up, here's what used to happen in our church. I'd be like, okay, that's enough. Close her down. Let's pray. Because we're afraid it's going to get out of the banks. We're afraid a demon may manifest. Somebody might fall out in the floor and visitors are here. Well, maybe one of them visitors will fall out in the floor, praise God. And I used to think everything had to be so structured. Everything had to be so right. Everything had to be so perfect. And God said, no, no, no. I do not have to operate with your formula. Because he's been doing this in the church for 2,000 years. And the same Holy Spirit that started on the day of Pentecost is still releasing his presence to this day. And it will remain that way until the great and notable, terrible day of the Lord. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, shall be healed, shall be delivered, shall be set free, shall be turned around by the power of the gospel. We can't deny that. It's clearly in the text. And I want to be faithful to the text. So I say this. I could end a thousand ways. I'm never done. I just stop. Little boy got in trouble at school one day. Well, mama found out about it. There was a day that teachers would, you know, call mama and daddy while the kids got in trouble. And so sure enough, when Junior got off the bus and got home, mama knew about it. And she said, we will not have this disrespect in our home. You understand me? So I'm going to give you one of the punishments that you hate more than anything else. Oh, my goodness, he knew right what it was. It wasn't even a whooping. It was worse than that because he was so terrified of the dark. She said, I'm going to put you over in the timeout closet. Sit you on a little stool, shut the door, put a towel under the crease and crack of the door so no light gets in. And for one hour, you sit in the dark and think about what you did at school. Well, he had so much anxiety about that, he couldn't see straight. He got in there, got on that stool. She got ready to shut that door. And just as the door was getting ready to close, she said, Now, Junior, I must remind you that Jesus will be in the closet with you. She shut the door, put the towel across the bottom of it, and it was dark. About 15 minutes went by. She's, you know, just outside the door in case something goes wrong. Nothing. 30 minutes, nothing. About 40, 45 minute mark, that little boy started talking in a small, trembling voice. And she heard him say, Lord Jesus, I know you're in this closet with me. But whatever you do, don't you move because you will scare me absolutely to death if you do. And that's what a church in America is. Lord, we know you're here. Holy Spirit, we know you're here. But don't you move because if you move, you'll scare us absolutely to death. We'll have to cut the live stream off. We might lose some friends. We might lose some family. People might think we're Pentecostal or Charismaniac. No, I say let him move, let him move, let him move, let him move. Get on your feet and shout to the Lord in his house this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm excited that it's Pentecost Sunday, y'all. I was telling the girls the other day, I was like, I feel like it's prophetic that my 40th birthday is on Pentecost Sunday, you know, because... um, I'm going to tell you something. I was talking to Callie. I was like, Callie, I need to figure out like what this means. And so she sends me this whole thing the other day about the significance of 40 in the Bible. And I was like, well, help me, Holy Ghost. I needed to be 40 for a long time. Amen. First of all, let me tell you something. You've been lied to. If you're not 40 yet, man, 40 is not bad. It's great. I feel like I finally made it in life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm like, man, I'm a little bit more wise. My friends ain't got no drama. Like, I'm good. You know what I'm saying? 40's great. Amen. So she sends me this thing the other day, and it's talking about the significance of 40 and how, you know, the children of Israel, they were out in the wilderness for 40 years before they went into the promised land. Jesus was tempted for 40 days and 40 nights by the enemy in the wilderness, right? And I was like, well, I'll be I had like a lot of years that felt like that. But let me tell you something. The other night we were in, uh, where were we at? Charleston, South Carolina. We were in South Carolina. And I was standing up there and I was preaching all these people about the prophet Elijah because I love Elijah. Elijah's crazy, y'all. He's like my favorite prophet in the Bible. I love Elijah so much. And I was standing up there and I was like, this is that. This is that. 
This is the days that the Lord is pouring out his spirit upon all flesh. And I'm watching his sons and his daughters prophesy. And I'm watching dead things come back to life. And I'm watching people stand up and say, oh, Lord, would you just give me the mantle of Elijah? Would you give me the mantle of Deborah, Lord? Would you give me the mantle of Esther? Because God's people are tired of dead religion. We're tired of showing up and coming in one way and leaving the same way. Oh, no. Oh, Lord, we want you to show up right now. We want you to do for us like you did for the prophet Elijah when he laid across the widow's son three times and that little boy came back to life. And oh, Lord, we need the Holy Ghost to fill our prayer life that when the famine comes, our prayers just open up the windows of heaven that the rain would come. And I don't know about you, but I know about a Holy Spirit rain that wants to fall over the children of God in this day. I know about a Pentecostal fire that wants to show up right now. It wants to bring dead things back to life for you right now. Oh, I know about a bomb of Gilead that wants to flow over you from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. I know at the mention of Jesus. 
Jesus over every seat of discord. I plead life in Jesus' mighty name. Oh, I, I plead the fruits of the Spirit on every seed that falls to the ground in this house. I plead good soil in Jesus' mighty name. Oh, Just let them worship. If you're here for baptismal celebration, come around to my right over there. We've got changing rooms over here. Go ahead and get lined up. Give hollow to the Lord. Come on right now. Let's get our baptismal celebration. Hallelujah. Come on on. They're going to worship. You need help? Come on. You need prayer? Come forward. We'll lay hands on you. You don't have to wait through the night at 6 o'clock for a mass deliverance service. we got a whole team of people that will help you. You come lay out on this altar. We'll help you. We'll anoint you. We'll pray over you right now. Come on. Come on. I want to do this. A lot of times I do this after the baptisms and them demons don't scare us. So we're just going to let them keep screaming. Looser now. We, we do this afterwards, but we're going to do it before because uh, we, we didn't want everybody to, to leave out. But we have all oh, baby dedications are special. But uh, boy, we got a little Esau hairy head Hank today, praise God, that we get to dedicate before the Lord. So come on up here, Ricky and Kelsey and baby Hank. We're going to pray over them. Dedicate this precious baby to the Lord. This family's already been dedicated. Wow, look at that head of hair right there. Isn't that crazy? Wow, got more than daddy. <laughs> Let's pray over this family right now. Father, in Jesus' mighty name, thank you that, Lord, this is really prophetic because they came to us some time ago through deliverance, Lord, and you so set this family free and, and now not only driving a bus but running the Global Vision Adoption Foundation and now when we dedicate their baby, what do we hear? We hear the very thing that set them free, Lord. We, we hear freedom in the house, deliverance in the house. Lord, we thank you for this couple. We thank you for their service to the kingdom, their love for you, their love for each other, their love for this precious baby boy. Lord, thank you for Hank. Thank you for life and life more abundantly. We know that babies, children are a gift from God. And we thank you for this gift. 
Oh, Father, we thank you for this bundle of joy. Lord, we pray for health and strength over this baby. Lord, we pray that Hank would come to Jesus at an early age, that there would be a prophetic anointing that would be placed upon him. And Lord, if Jesus tarry, he would change hundreds of thousands of lives with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Bless this home financially. May the face of your favor gloriously shine upon them. Bless them with health and with peace and with strength and with unity. And Father, we just say that as a local church family, we love them. We stand with, behind, beneath, above, before, all around them. We support them. We honor them. We reverence the work of God in their life. But right now, Father, from the top of this little baby's head to the sole of his feet, would you captivate his heart at a young age? Would you protect him and use him? Oh, Father, would you dispatch your angels to protect this family, to bless this family and honor them? And Lord, we exalt you because we know that this is not just a baby dedication. It's a family dedication. And we give them to you as they've already surrendered themselves to you honor and bless them we pray in the mighty name of Jesus and the church shout it out hallelujah hallelujah yes to God be the glory you keep getting what you need here at the altar we're going to transition to the baptismal booth baptize some converts hallelujah and look the tent will be open all day if you've got to rest and relax. And tonight, 6 o'clock, it'll get wild, wild west. I'm telling you, although a few little deliverances are flaring up, wait till tonight. I'm telling you, you're going to be set free. God is going to radically set you free in this two-hour service tonight. People are going to be healed. Cancer is going to flee. Folks are going to get out of wheelchairs. I'm telling you, we watch it every week. God is going to get his glory, and the devil is going to be shamed. Can you shout amen and give the Lord some praise?